Hi, I'm Jennifer Howard with the Archive of American Television. Today is August 12, 2004, and it is my great pleasure to be interviewing Nanette Febre in Pacific Palisades, California. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, we usually like to start our interviews by taking a few minutes to talk about your early years and influences. And the first question we'd like to ask is, what was your name at birth? Ah, oh, good question. My name, my full name is Ruby Bernadette Nanette Teresa Fabre Tebbett MacDougall, okay? But I chose Nanette to use it professionally because I was actually from my Aunt Nanette who lived in San Diego where I was born. And uh, did you have any nicknames with the name Nanette? Nanny Goat, sometimes. When were you born? October 27th, 1920. And this October, I will be 84, and I'm thrilled that I've come this far. Well, congratulations. When were you born? Or, I'm sorry, where were you born? I was born in San Diego. Well, let's say I was dropped in San Diego because Mother uh, was there, and I had, she had me, and then we moved immediately to Los Angeles, to Hollywood. And Hollywood is where you grew up? Mm-hmm. I grew up in Hollywood. Uh, went to Lee Junior High School, Hollywood High School. What was your father's name? My father's name was Raul Bernard Fabre. Uh, it's pronounced many ways. My niece Shelley Fabre uses Fabre, which is one of the pronunciations. And when I was in, in um, New York and Meet the People, actually, I'm going to jump way ahead a little bit in my career. I went with the show Meet the People from Los Angeles to New York. And um, I was invited. We got there New Year's Eve in 1940, 41, something like that. I was invited to perform at uh, Madison Square Garden and a big benefit they had for the Spanish Refugee Appeal. And the number that I did was uh, from the show Me the People, I sang Cara Nomi from the opera Rigoletto and then I did a tap dance to it. It was very cute, very funny. And I was on stage and Ed Sullivan was the MC. Well, he didn't become as good about pronouncing people's names as he did later on. And you know, he was terrible. And so I was off stage. He had my name written on a card, and uh, it said Nanette F A B A R E S. And Mrs. Roosevelt had gone on just ahead of me and gave this fabulous speech for the refugee Spanish war appeal, whatever it was. And then Ed Sullivan comes out and he says, "Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome." And he looked at his little card F A B, and he says, "Miss Nanette Faberas." And uh, I changed the spelling of my name the next day. So Shelley still uses Fabre, Fabre, Faberas, whatever she wants to call herself. I chose to make as, as close as I could get it to be Nanette Fabry, F-A-B-R-A-Y. Did your family mind at the time that you changed it? My family didn't have much choice about me changing my name. I was in New York. <laughs> well, now back to your parents. Uh, what did your father do for a living? Papa drove a train. And my, one of my very earliest memories is going through the train, telling everybody, I'm going up to the engine and watch my father run this train. Uh, it was very exciting to, to go back and forth like that with my father. Um, Mama and Papa divorced when I was about eight or nine. But uh, he was very poor. We were very poor. And so he had no place to go. So he lived in the house. I mean, it was a very strange situation. <laughs> I had a sister and I had a brother. Both of them quite a bit older than I. What was your mother's name? My mother it was Lily McGovern. And uh, she hated being called Lily. She hated her second name even worse. It was Agnes. My niece Shelley is married to Mike Farrell, the wonderful actor. And his mother, his, his mother was named Agnes. And uh, she loved the name. And I told a very funny story about how my mother didn't like her name. So she went to a psychic and had her name changed to Lolita Datri, and that lasted until she came home with it. And, of course, we laughed her out of that. She was quite a character. Uh, what did your mother do for a living? Mother was a, a wife, a housekeeper, and, as I said, because we were very poor during the Depression, uh, Mama took in boarders, and um, we had a big household of roomers and boarders. My job was to iron everybody's shirts in the morning. I can... I demonstrated this on the Johnny Carson show. I can still iron a shirt in one minute flat and uh, do a pretty good job of it. What were your other hobbies growing up besides ironing the shirts? Growing up, 
I did not want to be in show business. I really just wanted to get married and have babies. I fell in love when I was about 15, and that lasted quite a long time until I went to New York. Uh, he wanted nothing to do with being married to me, but uh, I think he maybe regretted it later on. I don't, we'll never know. But um, I just wanted to get married, and my mother was a, what you really call a show business mother. She pushed me. Uh, I hate to see children in show business because I think it's very hard on them to try to understand what an adult has to know. You have to learn your lines, you have to be on time, you have to know what you have to do. And childhood, to me, should just be a fantasy time. It should be a time to enjoy what you're doing. Just be a baby. And uh, I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, I, I, I hated show business. And it wasn't until about my third Broadway show, uh, it was either Noel Coward or Laurence Olivier came backstage and said to me, you know, you have a lot of talent and you're going to be a big star. Well, I was already a star of a show and didn't know what I was doing. And he said, you're going to find in time that you're going to love what you're doing. He said, I could tell out front that you we're doing it, and you're doing a good job of it, but you still haven't reached through to the audience to tell the audience that you love having them there. And soon after that, I realized what he was saying, and uh, it was true. I fell in love with the audience, and I fell in love with performing. But that was my third Broadway show. When did you first begin performing? My first professional job was when I was three in Los Angeles at the old Million Dollar Theater in downtown Los Angeles. I was Miss New Year's Eve, and I was supposed to come out at midnight, and I had a little I had a little strap of satin across the front of me. It said 1923 on it, and the apparently the fellow in the, the light booth was drunk. He never could quite find me with the light, and I was standing there waiting to have him get me so I could say, you know, Happy New Year. But a policeman came on stage and picked me up and put, put me under his arm, and the theater was raided. It was a burlesque theater, and uh, Mama came running around the back. I was gone. I was in the paddy wagon. <laughs> Imagine being arrested at three years of age. How did your career progress from there? Well, uh, Mama had me study tap dancing. And if you ask me what I am, I will tell you I'm a tap dancer and then anything else, a singer, dancer, comedian. But tap dancing is my primary interest. I love it. I love it. I studied with um, a wonderful tap dancer named, uh, um, oh, I can't remember. He was a Scottish dancer, taught me how to use my feet. And then I took two or three routines from uh, Bill Robinson, Bojangles, you know, and I learned to work with him. Um, I did a couple of, I was an extra in a couple of big television, uh, uh, movies when I was very little. In fact, that's how that problem of me being called a member of the Argan County came about. I was, when I was in my early teens, I won a scholarship to the Max Reinhardt School of Acting. And from there, I was signed under contract to Warner Brothers, one of those young starlets, six months contracts. And well, what did I have to say that I could do? So I met with the press department, and they said, well, what have you done? I said, well, I, in one of the R Gang comedies, I was with about 50 kids, and we had to walk through some pies. And he said, oh, the R Gang comedy. And I think that's where it started. I was never really a member of the R Gang comedies. That that story has followed me my whole life. I've tried to get rid of it. It's in every biographical study there is about me. And people say, we loved you in the Argan comedies. And I was never in the Argan comedies. Please, let's kill that story. I think that's been killed at this point. Uh, as a child performer, did you also appear in other vaudeville uh, houses uh, in Los Angeles? I, as a matter of fact, I did. I did appear in vaudeville. Uh, I remember I was in one show where Ben Turpin, who could cross his eyes, he was trying to teach me how to do that. And it was when they had the first big, beautiful, big uh, movies. And uh, several times I would climb out on the stage and try to look at the picture, like the movie like that, but they would have to drag me backstage. It was, um, I was maybe six, seven, eight years old. I remember one time my mother was horrified. I had watched a girl curl her eyelashes or put false eyelashes or whatever she was doing. And so I took a pair of scissors and was trying to do the same thing. I cut my eyelashes off, and Mama was out front. I suddenly came out on the stage, and you couldn't see my eyes. It's a miracle I didn't do some damage to myself. You know, kids shouldn't, not, kids shouldn't be in show business. Uh, did you also perform in high school productions? Ah, high school. I went to Hollywood High School. 
I had one of the great, great uh, teachers, drama teachers, Mr. Arch, Arthur Cachel, and uh, I beat uh, Alexis Smith out of the senior school play. And uh, she said, many years later, she said, I've never forgiven you for that. She said, you got the senior school play. And Arthur Cachel was the one who first told me, he said, you really are very talented. He said, you don't know it yet, but you are, you're going to be very important in, in some kind of show business somewhere. My assignment in high school was to learn 25 lines of Shakespeare. And, and I took, a, opened the book, picked a page that had about nine characters in it, and play, try to be all characters, and I was so interested in doing it that I learned the whole page, and I, I think it was from Titus Andronicus. That kind of rings a bell somewhere. Very complicated play. Uh, what year did you graduate? I graduated in nine, the summer of 1939, I think it was. I didn't know in high school that I had a hearing problem. I have something called oto, meaning ear, otosclerosis, means that the little bones would close up. And, uh, of course, in those days, they didn't do tests for you like they do now, eyesight, hearing, and, and emotional problems. They try to find them early now, but in those days, they didn't. And I didn't know that I was hearing less and less in the classroom. I didn't know that when the teacher turned to the board to write something, that she was still talking or he was still talking. And so by the time I was in my senior year, I flunked practically everything, and I was allowed to graduate with my class only if I would come back in summer school and make it all up. So I did graduate with them. That did pretty much damage to my ego. I felt that if the best I could do was less than anybody else in the class, that I was stupid. And it wasn't until many years later that I had a great teacher come to me and say, we're going to run tests on you. And I found out I wasn't stupid. I just didn't hear well. I've had four surgeries to restore my hearing, and I now hear just great. That's terrific. Uh, were you able to go to college after high school? College. I went to Los Angeles Junior College, as it was called. And uh, after about three or four months, somebody came up to me and said, you really aren't going to make it in college anywhere. You, you'd do very well just to go off and do something else. Cause I didn't know I should attend classes, and when I would attend the lectures, I would, couldn't hear what they were saying, and, and apparently I was really flunking out through junior high school, at junior college too, so never did make college. Though I do have four honorary doctorates for being smart, <laughs> and I'm thrilled about that. That definitely is a great, uh, great and thing. And I have to jump around a bit. Uh, because of my hearing problem, uh, when I got to Washington, D.C., I had given a very important speech about it was necessary to support people who were, were, had hearing problems, who were the deaf. And I was swept up in Washington by a fabulous woman named Mary Switzer. She became head of the World Health Organization. And she said, we need somebody who will be a speaker for the hearing impaired. She said, may I use you? And I said, of course. So she walked me through the backstage of what I would call backstage of the Congress both the Senate and the House, and I met a lot of people there, and I became an advocate. As a, I spoke for the deaf, for the hearing impaired. And because I had been told that I would someday go deaf, which was not true, I never did, I decided that I would have to learn how to communicate. And so I studied sign language, and uh, I was an advocate to bring sign language to the public. To the deaf at that point were very ashamed of being deaf, they hid their deafness. They, it was very hard for them to get work, to get employment. And um, when I started doing the television shows like the Hollywood Squares, I would do the I love you sign. I, L, Y. I love you. That's the sign for I love you. And I would do that on the television shows. Now a lot of the uh, game show hosts do that. They, I don't even know if they know what that means, but we picked up hundreds of thousands of deaf people who would watch television in order to just see me say, I love you. Uh, I'm jumping around a lot. When I was in Washington, uh, I realized that the deaf had a terrible problem communicating in any way. They didn't have telephones that they could use. Television, watching television meant nothing to them. And so I felt that we should have some way to have captioning on television where the deaf could read it. I wasn't alone. You can't, I cannot take credit for all of that. but. 
it was a something that was coming to the front. We realized that we must have some way for the television audience to include the deaf. And so I was a founding member of the National Captioning Institute, and uh, it was a very, very important uh, step forward for the deaf. For instance, a very close good family friend of mine, deaf, both a man and his wife, and uh, when uh, Bobby Kennedy was shot, they were watching television, there was no captioning, and the way the world looked like chaos, they had no way of knowing what was wrong. Were we being attacked? What was happening? This great man has been killed. And the same thing when President Kennedy was shot. They had no idea. Were we being, as it was America being under attack? It was important that we had some way to communicate with the deaf. At that point, there were about 25 or 30 million hearing impaired people, people who had enough hearing problems that they came forward and became a statistic. So that was a very important step forward for television to have captioning. We're now putting it into foreign languages so that people with a foreign language can watch captioning and see it in two languages. It's a very important step forward for television. What kind of feedback have you gotten from your fans uh, from this involvement? Uh, I've sort of retired from all the hard work that I was doing for handicapped people. I was a, also a founding, uh, with a presidential appointment, founding board member of the National uh, uh, Institute of the Handicap, National, what was it called? National Council on the Handicap, something like that. We wrote the American with Disabilities Act, and that took care of, of, of many handicapped people with curb cuts and uh, ramps into pres important buildings and things like that. That was a very big step forward for them. You know, way back after the First World War, uh, they became aware that something should be done for people who were blind. And so the first rehabilitation program was to allow blind people to sell magazines and newspapers in post offices. That was the first of anything for some kind of rehabilitation for people. And I'm getting off on a big subject that will take hours. Let's get back to something that's more pleasant in my career. Okay? How about television? I've got a good one for you. What was the first time that you saw television? The first time I saw television when I was on it. This was in the 1930s somewhere in downtown Los Angeles. I was paid five dollars to come down and be a person to be on television. And I didn't know what it was. They took me into the makeup room and put black lines around my eyes, blackened up my eyebrows, did black circles around my nose, my mouth, and around my hairline. And that picture was shown from one room to another. And then they had somebody else who sat in and I was able to see what te television was going to be. Uh, many, many years later, in the early 40s, I became the color girl for uh, RCA, for NBC. At that time, there was a big fight between CBS and NBC as to which color system would be used. CBS had a wheel, a color wheel that spun very fast, and the color was gorgeous, very clear. But it was discovered that they could never make a wheel bigger than 18 inches, and they knew that someday a television set would be bigger than 18 inches. Meanwhile, General Sarnoff had seen one of my shows and invited me to come in and be the color girl to represent NBC's color. Now, in those days, the color, they had tubes, I think they were called, color, whatever. The color would drift. It would, if the green tube would go a little bit green and the red tube would get a little purple, and I thought I was hired to be their color girl because of my great talent. It turned out my skin tone is dead center in the color spectrum. It's neither too red or too yellow too, or whatever. I was hired because of my skin. But uh, my job was to be able to be available at any time. General Sarnoff had somebody that was important, congressman, senator, FCC, anybody that would come down. We had a half-hour program that we would put on and it would go from one studio up into the general's office, and it would show it to one person, anybody. And the, my job after that was to, I don't know what went off. I'll just pick it up with General Sarnoff. All right, you were talking about uh, your work as a color girl. Right. Sorry, my phone went off. Um, general Sarnoff hired me to be his color representative, and we had a half-hour show with Ema Sumac, that crazy girl who was supposed to be from South America and had a voice that only birds could hear. And then we had the little budgies. They did the little act where they pulled the trailer back and forth, the little teeny tiny birds. 
And then I sang a couple of songs. They were able to show how they could bring the color down to look like a, a moonlight. And that was a very, very important thing to be able to do with the RCA color. And I did that for two or three years, I think. Uh, no, a couple of years. I was, had to be available. I had to call into the studio, call General Sarnas' office every hour in case somebody had shown up. I was in makeup all day long, and I was doing a show at night, High Button Shoes. And uh, yeah, so that places it around 1944, 45, somewhere in there. And um, I made more money doing General Sarnoff's show than I did my whole theatrical career, I think. I got paid for each program. How many do you think you ended up doing? I have no idea. I, it went on for weeks and weeks until they finally were approved. Their color program, color system was approved. Now, you had mentioned that uh, you moved eventually to New York. Um, is this where you received your professional training as an actress? Um, I, in, in, in Los Angeles, I was put into a show called Meet the People. It was a little local show that played here for about a year. And uh, I can't remember the theater. And then we went across the, toured across the country and went to New York. And we played in New York. We opened in New York. Uh, around New Year's Eve. That was when I had my run-in with Ed Sullivan. And uh, um, yes, I did that show, and then I went from that show on to other shows. Uh, during that time, in that show, uh, Meet the People, I, I told you, I sang the song, Karanomi, and out front one night was Art Cherudzinski, who was then the conductor of the uh, New York Philharmonic. And he heard me singing this opera song, he was across the street watching Pal Joey with Gene Kelly. And in those days, we had no air conditioning in the theaters. And so when it got hot, they would just open the doors. Anybody could walk in and see any show. So uh, Dr. Vincinski crossed the street to see who was singing opera and sent his card backstage. I, didn't, I thought he was a rug dealer. I had no idea who Radzinski was. And somebody said, he's a very important man. You better call back. So I called his office, and he said, I want to sponsor you to study opera. And he called Juilliard, and I went up to Juilliard, and I studied up there for about four or five months, but it interfered with my nighttime work, which was doing musical comedies, which I just loved. At that point, I think I had moved on to do the, uh, let's face it, with Danny Kaye. And uh, uh, also, I loved nightclubbing. I loved to go dancing and playing around. So. Also, I had been given a, an opportunity, at, all at the same time, the same era to appear to play the lead in the show in a play called Claudia which went on to become a wonderful hit Broadway show and a movie but I turned that down I turned down opera and I chose musical comedy which is where my career finally wound up being uh, I did 12 Broadway shows just loved it just loved it during one of the shows with Alan J. Lerner and Kurt Weill, which was Love Life, we never made an album because the week that we opened in New York, the musicians went on strike, never made an album of that wonderful show. It was wonderful. Uh, in fact, Alan J. Lerner stole one of my songs called I Remember It Well and gave it to the uh, movie Gigi, Hermione Gingold and um, Maurice Chevalier sang it. In the movie. That was my song. They get credit for it. Anyway, uh, I had a wonderful, exotic career on stage. And uh, every time uh, Judy Garland at that point was having a lot of trouble physically and emotionally, I got a call to come would, from MGM and I come and do uh, Annie Get Your Gone. I couldn't because I was on a show. I was called to do several shows for MGM. And finally, Alan J. Lerner, when he signed his contract with Arthur Freed at MGM, he said, you better sign her because she's wonderful. You can use her in a lot of musicals, especially the things that you've lined up for Judy to do. So I went out, made a screen test, which I'll tell you about, um, and Arthur Freed said, we don't want to put you in as a big star right now. He said, we will put you in a show where you have a second part, second lead, and that was the bandwagon. And of course, after the bandwagon, not only did MGM close down, all of the studios closed down because of the invasion of television. It just, people didn't go to the theater anymore. I have to tell you about my screen test. Oh, please do. Um, it was, I think, the most expensive screen test ever made at any studio. It ran 22 minutes. 
Uh, it was directed by George Sidney, who was a very big director at the time. Lewis Calhern did the narration. I did two big dance numbers that were orchestrated by Johnny Green, and the vocalists were done by Roger Edens. Uh, I did two big dance numbers, but George Murphy went on to become a U.S. Senator. And they were going to show this screen test of mine around the world to introduce their new big musical comedy star. And of course, the studio closed down, and I never did find a copy of that screen test. I'd give anything to have a copy of it now. But uh, I never became a big movie star. In fact, I went back to New York looking for a job. Sid Caesar. My agent said that Sid Caesar and Imogene had split up, and he was looking for somebody to be a guest on his show. And I went in to see Sid, and I said, well, I don't know if I can do a whole hour show. I'm used to doing musicals where we have six weeks to rehearse. He said, do the show. He said, we'll see how it goes. Well, let's stop right there for just a minute, because I don't want to jump ahead to, uh, to your work with Sid quite so quickly. Uh, I do want to go back just a moment and ask you, hadn't you also appeared in feature films uh, for Warner Brothers? Ah, yes. I jumped around a lot in this. Uh, when I was, when I won the, uh, the um, I, won, I won some kind of an award for Max Reinhardt to study with him. And uh, uh, at that time, they were looking for somebody to be under contract to Warner Brothers. I think I told you I did uh, had a six months contract at Warner Brothers. Did I tell you that? No. Which, what sort of films did you? Okay, do? I'll tell you anyway. Uh, I was signed as a starlet to do uh, six months, so they put you in everything. And my first big picture was with Elizabeth and Essex uh, to play with Betty Davis and Errol Flynn. And uh, at that time, um, I, I was new. I you know uh, uh, what was his name? The director of the picture. Anyway, anyway um, the director of the picture. Michael Curtiz. Michael Curtiz, thank you. Uh, I had my first big scene was with Betty Davis, and I was supposed to uh, be her maid in waiting, and I was supposed to run across the stage and fling myself at her feet. And uh, Betty Davis was wondering. I remember we didn't have air conditioning in the studios at that time either, and she was sitting there in these hot costumes. The poor darling, she was so nice to me. And I ran across the soundstage and slid right past her, you know, and disappeared. And so Michael Curtis said, well, no, you have to come back. You have to look for your spot, your mark. And I didn't know what that meant. So somebody said, there's a piece of tape on the floor. So uh, I ran, I started across the floor, but I'm busy looking for it. And he said, no, 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 no. They stopped the camera. You must be able to see it out of the corner. Well, we did four versions of this. You know, we're walking around looking for my tape like this. Finally got the picture. Betty Davis, bless her heart, she was, she was very amused by this and very patient with me. And we did a very marvelous scene that uh, uh, stayed in the picture because of my friendship with Max Reinhardt and Eric Wolfgang Korngold, who was a good friend of Reinhardt. Uh, when the picture opened, uh, I got very good notices. And Olivia de Havilland didn't want me to be that big a star in that picture. This is what I learned from Korngold. I was told it wasn't true. I was told that de Havilland did not ask to have me fired, but this is Korngold's version of it. Now, I heard that Olivia de Havilland is a very sweet and lovely person. I don't remember her on the picture, but I will tell you the version, that I was told that I should be fired. And Korngold said, if we fire her, we have to re reorchestrate the whole picture, because the love the scene starts, the theme of the music loves me, starts with her scene. And so Jack Warner said, how much will that cost? And he said, it'll cost a quarter million dollars. And he said, she stays in the picture. And that's how I got to Now, that's Korngold's version. Well, let's stop right there for just a moment and change tape. Okay. <laughs> 